Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Corinna Hawkes here, Director of the Centre for Food Policy. Uh, welcome to this first, first Food Thinkers uh, webinar, Women Changing Food Systems. Uh, the first time that we've had a Food Thinkers webinar uh, for obvious reason. I just want to start by checking that you can hear me. Uh, so if you are a participant, uh, can you uh, quickly add to the, the notes, the Q&A, um, just say yes or, or something of such. My, I know that um, Barbara can hear me and that Elaine can hear me, um, but if you could um, just check, if I could just check that everyone can hear me. OK, so I'm going to carry on. Um, welcome, everybody. And as I said, uh, welcome to this first in our Food Thinkers um, food think uh, think thinkers series. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to, um, to initiate uh, these series of webinars, uh, which enable us to continue the conversation which these Food Thinkers are designed to uh, create. Uh, thanks very much for joining. I know there's so much going on online at the moment, so it's great to have so many people with us. Uh, thanks for joining. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Barbara Bray, MBO of Allo, uh, MBE of Allo Solutions. Uh, Barbara Bray is the director of um, uh, consultancy Allo Solutions, which she set up in 2014. So the, the focus of the talk today is very much and very deliberately so on the business sec sector. It's um, the first time in this series we've had a focus, someone who actually comes from business and has experience in business. She spent three years in the Ugandan agribusiness sector, followed by 14 years in the UK chilled food sectors and food procurement, technical advice and management. And uh, her consultancy business now provides food safety advice, nutritional specification writing, technical development and training for fresh produce and food manufacturing clients. And she was awarded an MBE last year in 2019. And she's also a director of the Oxford Farming Conference. And Barbara's going to talk to us um, with the title Women in the Food Business, Redesigning Food Companies for Sustainable uh, for sustainable uh, nutrition and she's going to present a vision for us today for food businesses for the future a, a future that i think we all want to see where businesses prioritize sustainable nutrition um, environmental eating and transparent supply chain and she's going to give examples of companies who already have a focus on sustainable nutrition and of the work that she's doing to support these companies and uh, what's going to be in common to all of the webinars moving forward is that all of the speakers will focus on um, the, the implications of COVID-19 for what they are talking about. So she's going to talk also about the impact of the ongoing situation on our food supply and how businesses might adapt. So great to have you with us, Barbara. I'd like to just mention to everyone that the seminar is being recorded and will be made available online after the event via our YouTube channel. If you would like to join our mailing list to hear about future events, uh, please post your name in the Q&A section. That will remain private, uh, so um, no one will be able to, to see that, but we will be able to add your name to the mailing list. And uh, we're going to have start with Barbara's presentation and then move to a question and answer session, which we'll read out after Barbara's talk. And we're going to endeavour to respond to all of your questions, but that will depend on time. We have an hour and a half um, in total. Um, if you do want to tweet as you're sitting there watching the webinar, please do use the hashtag food thinkers and um, our uh, handle, our Twitter handle is at food policy city. Uh, so um, this is the first in a series of webinars. We're going to be having monthly webinars from now on in the Food Thinkers series, and we'll be announcing those um, those details shortly. So, as I said, welcome everyone, um, and I would um, now like to welcome uh, Barbara um, to give you a presentation. We're really looking forward to it. Please go ahead. Hi, Corinna, and thank you very much for the warm welcome. I'm really honoured to be presenting this evening on your first Food Thinkers webinar. And I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's questions and getting involved in and in having a good old debate at the end. Alone, we go faster. 
Together, we go further. That's a strap line I have for my consultancy business, which I set up in 2014. But before I tell you more about what I do, I'd like you to imagine that we're in the year 2040, 10 years after the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals should have been achieved. The deadline had to be extended, but it was worth it. Now there is zero hunger and our food system is based on regional supply food supply chains. People enjoy food in ways that we could only dream of in 2020, taking the time to eat with family and friends and enjoy good quality meals and snacks. Type 2 diabetes has almost been eradicated and the changes in the food environment mean that whole foods, mainly plants, are commonplace in the home and at the community clubs where many people now go to eat and relax with neighbours. Now let me take you back to the 1980s, the time of Finder's Crispy Pancakes, VHS video and the invention of roller blades. Marks and Spencer's, the nation's upmarket supermarket or food shop, was building on the success of its first ready meal, chicken Kiev with garlic. And Walls had launched the Vionetta ice cream, you know, the soft white ice cream with its layers of crunchy chocolate folded in. Food was exciting. Food was innovative, but food was incredibly processed. The drive of the food industry was to make bigger, better and cheaper food and somehow the importance of food, our relationship with food and its value to our health was lost. The penny drop moment came for me after a 15 year career in the food industry. I started in the 90s, by the way, not in the 80s. I was tired of all this processing and I left my job at a, a, one of the UK's largest food manufacturers and went back to university to retrain as a nutritionist. Two years later, I was traveling the world on a Nuffield farming scholarship, researching healthy diets and looking for solutions to improve our nutrition. In fact, healthy meals packed full of vegetables were readily available in Hong Kong, Shanghai and wherever I went in South Korea. I'd been traveling for some time before I realized that I hadn't had any chocolate. Not because I didn't want to, but chocolate hadn't been obvious in my food environment and I hadn't missed it. I returned to the UK fitter and leaner, but with a better understanding of the influence of the food environment on our health. Two words, Google Trends. Now I'm sure I'm not the only one who likes looking at what other people are looking for on the internet. I pretend I'm browsing for work, but actually I'm fascinated. In March this year, searches for the term immunity peaked around the start of lockdown. People searched vitamin C and searches for the word veg went up and have stayed relatively high. Now, I'm sure if you're anything like me, you'll have Googled veg box delivery only to find out that you couldn't get a delivery for at least three weeks. As we all scramble to get our hands on fresh fruit and vegetables, sales figures showed that snacking and alcohol consumption went up worldwide. The stress of the COVID-19 situation was driving people to find solutions to both protect their health and also to find comfort. Some of these new shopping behaviours or some of these new healthy shopping behaviours may stay if they fit well with people's lifestyles. But there is a danger that old habits will take over as old routines are picked up again. In my food safety and consultancy business, I spent the first few years helping food businesses with food safety standards, educating staff on auditing and risk assessment and providing advice on nutrition traffic lights. In the last two years, since I did my Nuffield Farming Scholarship, I've noticed more food businesses taking an interest in building sustainable nutrition into their food strategy. And I'll talk about that more shortly. But back to my travels. In Hong Kong, Shanghai and in South Korea, I realised that the healthy choice is the easy choice. 
the tasty street food of crisp vegetable noodles and stir fry. The train station lunch of nourishing chicken porridge with fermented vegetables. And the tasty afternoon snacks of sticky bread rolls filled with bean curd were a world away from the chocolate crisps and, and sandwiches of the UK's meal deals. We need a culture change and the food industry needs to be part of the solution. There are foods that we try and ban from sale and exclude from our diet and obsess about, but healthy and affluent people have a choice in this country. They have a choice because where you live determines the quality of your life. Healthy and affluent people have a choice because they can avoid some of the damage caused by a modern lifestyle. And healthy and affluent people have a choice because they can afford to pay for better quality food. Well, that's if they choose to. But here's the thing. We're not all healthy, affluent people with unlimited choices. We have a diverse population with a whole range of needs. For example, we have a black and ethnic minority population genetically at higher risk of type 2 diabetes. We have an older adult population at higher risk of malnutrition, and we have a teenage population at higher risk of hidden hunger, despite overweight and obesity. All the extra food that they eat is not giving them enough fibre, folate, vitamin A and iron. We need a culture change and the food industry needs to be part of the solution. It's about taking food from our farms and putting it through our factories without stripping away the fibre under the nutrients. It's about having a positive dialogue with the consumer at the point of sale about healthy food. For example, if you think of Google headquarters in the US, their staff canteens serve food for free, but they've made the healthy choice the easy choice. So what they do is they put the salad and the vegetables at the entrance where you go in, so people pick those up first. They put the water in front of the fruit juice and in front of the fizzy drinks. But above all, the food is tasty, so people keep coming back for it because they enjoy it. So what's in it for the food industry? Well, businesses are designed to grow and make profit. They have to reinvest in their business, pay for ingredients, pay for staff and pay their taxes. But is the focus on profit and growth sustainable for the future of food? Let's take a look at the definition of sustainability. And the 1987 Brundtland report says that Sustainability is the paths of human progress that meet the needs and aspirations of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Here's a model that I created when I did my recent TEDx talk, just showing sustainability as a, a tripod, so three legs of equal length, and the three pillars of sustainability being people, profit and planet. The model has three equal legs or three legs of equal length to give it stability. And if, for example, I took the profit leg and made that leg longer, the model would lean over to one side and become unstable. So really it's representing the idea that you have to have equal focus on all of those three things in order to have true sustainability. So let me explain. If a business is focused on making profit, so it buys cheap ingredients and imports them from a country that's got water stress or drought, that has a negative impact on the planet. If a business buys cheap ingredients from a company that used forced labour or child labour to produce its goods, that cheap food has a negative effect on people. When a business decides to launch a range of foods that increase the risk of type 2 diabetes, when a business produces great nutritional, nutritionally complete food for older adults but they don't make a profit, or when a business produces food that contributes to the rise of obesity in young adults, that is not sustainable. Two words, sustainable food. 
The COVID-19 pandemic shone a light on food security in the supply chain worldwide, and sales of vegetable seeds and plants peaked as people rushed to start growing their own food. Well, I think I was the exception. I can grow a few herbs, but I'm definitely not cut out for growing my own food. All of a sudden, there was a huge interest in where food comes from, how it was grown and how healthy it might be. I wonder if this phase after, will last after the lockdown or whether people will look to trusted sources to provide their food. In my business, I work with fresh produce growers committed to providing sustainable food. And five areas we've identified to work on are improved nutrition, so focusing on nutrients we don't have enough of in our diet, measuring greenhouse gas emissions, reduction of food waste, sustainability certification, and sustainability sourcing or sustainable sourcing of raw materials. But first, let's take a look at the 17 S United Nations SDGs. So that's just a quick reminder of what we need to achieve by 2030. So now I'm going to go through the five areas that we're focusing on with the producer organisation that I work with. Firstly, improve nutrition. In the UK, 30% of us are overweight and another 30% of us are obese, but we're still not well nourished. The National Diet and Nutrition Survey states that for a number of micronutrients, including vitamin A, riboflavin, folate, iron, calcium, iodine, potassium and zinc, reductions in intake and an increase in the proportion of people with low intakes below the lower reference nutrient intake was seen. We should be getting 30 grams of fibre from our daily food, but we're only getting 18 grams. As food producers, that's food manufacturers and growers, we should be looking at what levels of nutrients are ending up in the finished product and taking a look at processes to make sure that we don't reduce the amount of fibre, for example. Growers can look at what additional minerals can be added to the growing medium of field and protected crops. This is known as biofortification, where you add the vitamins and minerals to the crops so that they can benefit us as humans as nutrition. Biofortification projects are already well established in developing countries as a tool for managing malnutrition. And the opportunity for the UK lies in bridging the hidden hunger gap for people who have enough to eat, but who are not getting the right nutrition, but also for people who don't have enough to eat. The other group of people who may buy into this sector are those focusing on improving their health and who are happy to pay for food with a higher nutritive value. Crops which already have a history of biofortification include mushrooms, beans, leafy greens and grains. And the nutrients that can be increased through biofortification include selenium, iron and zinc. Let me give you a couple of examples of food that's already commercially available in the UK. Let's take vitamin D enriched mushrooms. The mushrooms are grown in, as usual in a big barn in the dark, but when they're harvested, they're placed into punnets and at the point of packing, they're passed underneath a beam of UV light that stimulates the production of vitamin D2. Another product, omega-3 enriched eggs, is also available. Western diets are currently deficient in omega-3 fatty acids and have excessive amounts of omega-6 fatty acids compared with the diet on which humans be beings evolved and their genetic patterns were established. So by feeding hens with a diet that's rich in foods of, that contain omega-3, this gets expressed in the eggs and it helps us from a human nutrition point of view. So finally, the, the food service sector. You might be well aware of an initiative called Peas Please, which is encouraging food manufacturers or food service sector people, so restaurants and caterers, to increase the amount of vegetables that are found in their menus currently and in the food to go. But we should look at things like dark green leafy vegetables and not just putting any vegetables in because we want things that are going to add value and going to add folate, for example. Which brings me on to an interesting point from an American food scientist called Cantha Schelk. 
She drew my attention to an issue last year when she talked about yoga mums with gluten free diets who unfortunately are now starting to give birth to babies with neural tube defects. This is due to a lack of folic acid in the diet caused by giving up wheat based products which are usually fortified with folic acid. But on the flip side, they're not increasing their intake of leafy green vegetables. And whilst it's really useful to add folic acid to flour, you need to meet people where they're at. If they're excluding something from their diet, it's very hard to convince them to put it back in. But you can convince them to add something to their diet that they were already enjoying. So, for example, more leafy green vegetables. The next area is greenhouse gas calculation. According to Google Trends, over the past 90 days, search interest in how to live a sustainable lifestyle has increased by more than 4,550%. The new situation is prompting people to look at life differently and seek out sustainable choices. The Food Climate Research Network FCRN states that the food system in the UK contributes around 19% to UK human made greenhouse gases, and that's excluding emissions from land use change from imported goods. If global land use change related, if global land use change related emissions were included, and that is the, the, land, the LUC related emissions embedded in foods imported for UK consumption, then the food related emissions would increase still further. We don't know about how much because that will vary. The major impacts come from the use of fertilisers, pesticides, manure, farming and land use change. Other contributions are much lower, but also of importance, such as transport, food manufacture, packaging, storage and cooking in the home and business. So, for example, food service and retail. The Carbon Trust launched an initiative in 2008 to measure, reduce and communicate the life cycle greenhouse gas or GHG emissions of goods and services or product carbon footprints. This included the development of, public, of a publicly available specification called PAS 2050, which is actually the first standard method for calculating greenhouse gas emissions or sorry, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of products. Now, the NFU last year, 2019, pledged that the UK would have zero emissions of greenhouse gases in the agricultural sector by 2040. Currently, the emissions from UK farms am amount to around 10% of UK greenhouse gas emissions. But in a stark contrast to the rest of the country, the economy, about a tenth of this is carbon dioxide. More than half of greenhouse gas emissions come from methane and about 40% from nitrous oxide. Reducing those emissions is much harder than reducing carbon dioxide because they result from complex soil and animal microbial processes. But what we can do is enhance the ability to capture carbon and use it to generate negative emissions by actively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to balance the methane and the nitrous oxide emissions from food productions. So the NFU, the National Farmers Union, are looking at three pillars. Firstly, boosting productivity and reducing emissions, doing the farmland carbon storage through things like bigger hedgerows, more trees, and increasing soil organic matter. But then a third thing, which is coupling bioenergy to carbon capture, utilisation and storage. So looking at initiatives such as wind turbines and solar panels as well. There are various tools that are available for the measurement, for example, the Cool Farm tool, which is favoured by LEAF. LEAF is a charity, it means linking environment and farming, and it's a standard that is in place for people who are concerned about farming in a responsible way for the environment and conservation. You've also got the UK Woodland Carbon Code, which is a voluntary standard for woodland creation projects. The thing for me is that we have lots of different standards and we don't yet have one that, that wins out, one that everybody is using in the same way. With Leafmark, for example, they have a benchmarking system and it's currently used by about 35 to 36% of the vegetable and horticultural growers in the UK. So I'd say it's the top tier people. The good thing about the benchmarking is you can see from an economic, ethical environmental 
environmental point of view, how you rank against your peers. Unfortunately, what you can't see is you can't dive into the data. And if you wanted to look at the ethical metrics, you couldn't pick one metric like, I don't know, staff turnover, for example, and see if your staff turnover was better than your farm neighbour across the road. And I think getting to that level of, of detail and that granularity is where really you can start to make improvements because you can see exactly how you can get to that point of improvement by looking at what your neighbours are doing. So let's move on to food waste reduction. In the UK, activity to drive down food waste 50% by 2030 is gathering pace. In 2015, RAP, the Waste and Resources Action Programme, reported that the value of food waste generated along the supply chain to the consumer had a value of £20 billion a year. Now, around 85% of this waste by weight is from households and food manufacture. And although this food is, ca is classified as waste, some of it is still edible and fit for human consumption. Fresh foods such as fruit and vegetables are particularly at risk of being wasted in the supply chain due to short shelf life, overproduction and labelling errors. As nutritionists, we joke that you never see in the food waste figures crisps and chocolate. And as a nation, we're not good at eating fruits and vegetables and the way we eat is causing obesity and, and overweight. The independent organisation, the Food Foundation, which examines the UK's food system, reported last year that the poorest 10% of people would need to spend 74% of their disposable income to meet the Eat Well Guide costs. Now, this is going to become relevant in what I'm about to tell you. Shoppers in the UK made an average of five extra trips to the supermarket in the week following the announcement of the COVID-19 social distancing guidelines. The additional shopping trips may have seemed like a sensible way of taking control of a situation, but this had a range of negative consequences. It disrupted the supply chain as logistics businesses, supermarkets, manufacturers and farmers rushed to restock. It left vulnerable people such as the elderly, people with diets restricted by allergies and people with low incomes without sufficient access to food. Whilst households in the UK have been storing extra food, there are now approximately 5 million households with children in food insecurity in the UK right now. Undoubtedly, COVID-19 has exposed the inequalities in our societal structure. Organisations such as Fair Share have been key in moving food that's not utilised in the food manufacture and retail stream. Last year, Fair Share were given a grant from DEFRA to take that back one step to primary agriculture. And really now is when we need that. If you think of back in, in the early days of the, the lockdown, when the large chains of fast food manufacturers and cafes shut their doors, it meant that a lot of farmers, so people in the primary agricultural sector producing milk and meat, suddenly had no home for their product. Milk producers were told by the processors that the milk wouldn't be collected and they'd have to reduce the level of production. Farmers desperately tried to feed as much of that milk to calves, but anything that they couldn't use had to be poured down the drain. All of this was happening whilst people across the UK were going hungry and going without food. This really shows us that the structure of our food system needs to change, that we have food available, but we can't get it to the vulnerable and we need to find a new way. I'd like to look at sustainability certification now and being a food safety consultant, I'm a huge fan of certification. I think making a commitment to do business better is great, but when you make that commitment in public, it can help drive further improvement and inspire others. One option is to make an assessment of your business to measure sustainability performance against targets and be able to benchmark against other companies who are also working towards sustainability goals. Two organisations I've highlighted are the B Corporation and Sustainable Restaurant Association. You may already be aware of organisations that are certified B Corporations, for example, Innocent Drinks, Patagonia and Picked the organic and plastic free veg box scheme. 
The system works with B Corporation, for example, by completing a self-assessment of around 250 questions that are across a range of categories that measure how sustainable the business is. And if you achieve a score that's high enough, that's when you're verified and certified as a B Corporation. So it shows the world that you have made an intention to be sustainable and you stick by what you have set out to do. The final initiative is sustainable sourcing. This is the integration of social, ethical and environmental performance factors into the process of selecting suppliers and sourcing raw ingredients. I mentioned earlier about businesses importing crops from countries with water stress or, or drought and responsible sustainable sourcing means that you look at the implications of doing that and find a way of sourcing better so you're not impacting a community and meaning they're not able to have access to valuable water. So we've talked about leaf linking environmental farming already. The others that also help with sustainable sourcing a SEDEX, which is enabling responsible supply chain. It's about sharing ethical data about the supply chain so people know that you're not using forced labour or child labour, for example. And there's also provenance who use blockchain to ensure transparency within the supply chain. It's really important in industries like the fishing industry where there's a lot of food fraud. The other example is the the app called Sweat and Toil, which was put together by the USA, um, I think it was Department of, or the USDA. And what I like about this app is that you can go on it if you're a coffee drinker, chocolate eater or, or tea drinker and whatever commodity, and you can see the supply chain of that particular food. So you can go and look at coffee com from Colombia and see whether the slavery in that supply chain or whether it has a poor reputation for using children in it. And I think there's going to be a lot more traceability going forward because of technology. There are growing expectations from customers, from investors, employees, NGOs, trade associations and governments to take responsibility for environmental, social and ethical practices. And sustainable sourcing policies and practices can also improve supplier relationships. The future of food and food businesses relies on healthy, sustainable choices being available for everyone, regardless of their disposable income, ethnicity and nutritional needs for their age group. People make food choices based on what's available in their food environment. And if that environment is damaging their health and the planet, then the system is unsustainable. It's time for us to move from a focus on profit to a balanced system of profit, planet and people. The following case studies show examples of businesses that have created food products that contribute to a healthy diet and that are produced in an environmentally responsible way. The first is Mellow Yellow, it's a brand of the British company Farrington Oils based in Northamptonshire. Duncan Farrington, the owner, is a Nuffield farming scholar and I met him in 2017 when I attended a Nuffield farming conference as a new scholar myself. He told a moving story about a family business which he joined as a fourth generation farmer, but it was soon evident that, far that farming, driving tractors and, and growing crops alone was not going to sustain the family business for another four generations. He went back to his research that he conducted at university on rapeseed oil and went on to produce cold pressed rapeseed oil, one of the best nutritionally balanced oils that you can buy. It's low in saturated fat, high in monounsaturated fats and has the ideal balance of essential omega-3 and 6 oils making it a great source for those essential fatty acids. Farrington's Mellow Yellow Cold Press Rapeseed Oil has made history by becoming the world's first food product to be certified as both carbon and plastic neutral. After 25 years of farming, from Duncan Farrington as a leaf mark grower, carbon and plastic neutrality is just another step in their approach to sustainability. And as part of their innovative leaf farming strategy, they've been nurturing healthy soils, reducing waste and recording energy usage for over 25 years. 
In the 1980s, they planted over 8,000 trees on their farm. And in the last couple of years, they've installed solar panels that now generate over half of their total energy requirement. They've partnered with One Carbon World and also become signatories in the United Nations Climate Change Neutral Now Initiative Pledge. They've also achieved carbon neutral gold standard, and this signifies the fact that Farrington oils are also offsetting their carbon emissions and again the first farm to do this. They've partnered with Repurpose Global, which means that Farrington oils now fund the removal of the same amount of plastic waste from the environment as they use in their packaging. So by becoming plastic neutral, Farrington oils are enabling the removal and recycling of plastic waste that would otherwise be landfilled or flushed into our oceans. On top of their official carbon figures, they're actually absorbing more carbon. So through long term carbon and soil health analysis, they've tracked the carbon sequestration in their soil. And in one particular field, they've increased the soil organic matter by over 66% in 16 years. So it really is an example of how you can focus on a healthy crop, not just for the environment, but also for the human health. My next example is corn foods. Now, I grew up in County Durham and frequently went past the Teesside based factory as a child. I was absolutely fascinated by the product story, but sadly never managed to get the opportunity to work at the factory. Corn is the brand name for a wide range of food products made with meat free protein ingredient mycoprotein. It's no cholesterol, low fat, low saturated fat and high fibre. The product has a low manufacturing impact compared to other protein rich products such as meat, and it represents an alternative dietary protein source. Now to demonstrate its environmental credentials of its products, Corn have partnered with the Carbon Trust since 2012 to independently certify reductions in the carbon footprint of its products against the standard that I mentioned previously, the PAS 2050. So this is communicated using the product labelling. So if you look at the packet, they've got that little footprint on the image, but they also put that on the website and sustainability reports. Corn also wanted to understand how the core products compare to animal based products on proteins on a, a full life cycle basis. So they got the carbon trust to independently verify the footprinting models that they've developed for its products emissions in different parts of the world so they can allow it to be compared against life cycle footprints for meat. So this is a logical step, but it does have a moving goalpost because obviously meat producers are also continuously trying to reduce their carbon footprint. And like the NFU have stated, wanting to become or work towards net zero. So if you look at the corn website, it currently talks about by choosing corn, you choose to protect the planet. Corn mints using uses 90 percent less land and produces 90 percent fewer carbon emissions than beef. It's simple. The more food conscious we become, the more our world benefits. Now, the company successfully re achieved recertification to the Carbon Trust footprint label every couple of years. And then due to continued work to improve efficiency and sustainability, they've been able to demonstrate continued reduction in the carbon footprint. For example, in the chicken pieces, chicken style pieces and mints, it's reduced by 15% and they've managed to get a 5% reduction in the core microprotein ingredient. So product footprinting has helped as well identify greenhouse gas emission hotspots within its supply chain. And this has helped the company engage effectively with its suppliers and help them reduce the carbon emissions as well. Now, in my opinion, the trend in veganism is actually one to watch because emissions of the corn vegan products of the, their product life cycle is actually higher than the emissions from the vegetarian range. However, corn has positioned itself well, and I imagine it's going to flourish well in the post lockdown world. My last example is the Watercress Company. I met Tom Amory, the MD from TWC, at least 15 years ago, and in that time the business, along with other producers, has elevated the status of watercress to mainstream salad. 
This Dorset based business now looks to help the NHS to tackle a fundamental issue relating to patient nutrition with the introduction of a nutrient dense watercress soup made exclusively from British ingredients. If initial trials at the Dorset County Hospital in Dorchester are successful, the company hopes to be to make the soup available across the NHS. Now this is an easy to consume, tasty and most importantly, it can be made within the existing financial constraints of a daily, daily meal budget provided to hospital catering teams. The aim is to provide a longer term format that can be delivered throughout the NHS, but also be reliably consistent in nutrition, energy and protein. Watercress is recognised as a natural source of fibre and it has protein as well as a range of, of vital antioxidants called glucosinolates and flavonoids. These protect against cell damage, which is the precursor to chronic disease and ageing. They're also associated with prevention of diabetes, cancer and cardiovascular disease. In fact, everyone at all stages in life benefits from the different nutrients that watercress can provide. The interesting thing here on the whole sustainability piece and crop usage is that the soup that's made in this trial is from UK winter grown crop which would actually go to waste because it's not sold because it doesn't meet the specifications and criteria for retail. The leaf is too large and the stems are thicker, which means it doesn't have a good eating quality. But it's actually the perfect crop that can be whizzed up into a soup. So the ultimate aim of the soup is for it to be frozen into blocks with the other ingredients and then you simply add hot water to it before blending, making the whole meal preparation quite simple for catering teams. And that means a consistent product can be available all year round. The intention is to develop a range of nutrient dense crops using different ingredients, all featuring watercress to provide a varied and healthy diet for patients. The good thing about this is it's in line with the NHS preference for first food approach. That means it's encouraging the consumption of actual food rather than supplements, which is not only beneficial for health, but could potentially make cost savings for the hospital. And this project is just the latest in a long line of collaboration between the Watercress Company and the Dorset County Hospital. They previously donated free watercress, helping the catering team give a nutrient boost for the patients, staff and visitors. They've made watercress smoothies for patients on the oncology ward and installed a free grab a bag of watercress fridge at the restaurant for passing people. So this project is a great example of a collaboration between farming and the health sectors, firstly to reduce crop waste but also to produce a product that contributes to human health and is grown in an environmentally, environmentally sustainable way. The COVID-19 pandemic has given us an opportunity to stop business as usual, to look at weaknesses in the current system and to implement a new normal. We have a range of tools and initiatives to, um, to make changes towards a more sustainable future that reduces inequality and brings us closer to meeting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. When we fast forward to 2040, I would love to look back at this year as a point in time when we started to reduce hunger and inequality. We started to create sustainable food businesses. And we started community clubs where everyone goes to eat and socialise, not just the vulnerable. I believe that collaboration across the food system, politics, private sector and civil society is vital to achieve this. Alone, we go faster. Together, we go further. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Barbara. A fascinating, uh, some great examples there at the end uh, and uh, very good um, pulling together of so many um, and critical important points in the, in the world of business and uh, being absolutely clear um, that putting profit before everything else just isn't workable and isn't sustainable into the future. 
Uh, so thanks very much for making that so so clear and uh, articulating it so well. Uh, so um, uh, thank you. We'd now like to go to uh, uh, questions. Um, I just uh, announced on the, the live event Q&A, uh, please do start asking any questions um, that you might have. And um, we're going to start with the first one, do, do add more. Uh, the first one is from Lisa Jack. Uh, Lee, uh, Professor Jack gave a presentation uh, back in um, January now. That seems like a, a long time ago. <laughs> A great presentation on, on food supply change, which is the subject of her um, question. And um, she talks um, about um, a, uh, the, 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 the way that supply chains, intermediary companies and supply chains are designed to deliver really precise measures throughout the system, throughout the supply chain, such as 25 kilogram bags of flour or whatever, uh, one kilogram bags to retail. Uh, and she says, well, we need some intermediaries who can manage the logistics of a swift change from food service to retail and services like food share. Uh, and she challenges and says that's quite difficult to change production lines. So her question is, who do you think should take the role on designing what she calls a just in case system rather than a just in time system? Is that um um uh yeah that's the question okay thank you it's a, a really interesting question because every nation in, on the planet at the moment is looking at what they're doing and wondering where did it go wrong i think in europe particularly because we have that system that it seemed to be seamless and had been delivering quite well for us until something went wrong and i think there are a couple of, of ways we can look at this. We can say, well, let's build a, a parallel system that we use just in case, or we have a, a system that's integrated and we have the flexibility to, to switch from one to the other. And I think, yes, it will add cost, whichever road you decide to go down. If you have a system that's only, you know, it's mothballed most of the time and you only bring it out when it's needed, that's quite costly. But then if you create, a different an alternative supply chain that um, you're having to push things through just because you might want to use it more flexibly that will, will change things as well i think whatever we do decide to do it it will add another dimension of cost into the system which is probably why we're best off looking at doing that from a, a policy level rather than leaving it to the free market because it, it doesn't really make sense for the free market to try and accommodate something that they don't necessarily need but Going back to the example I, I talked about earlier, when all of the, the, the cafes and the fast food chains closed, a lot of them were engaging with the likes of Fair Share to distribute food, but Fair Share is not set up in that way to, to manage a whole entire sector and it, it really fell apart. And it was so sad to see farmers not able to, to move their produce, but also really sad to know that vulnerable people were going without food. And I think we do need to to take stock as we come out of lockdown and, and look at what we can do from a policy level to to be able to switch on parts of the supply chain that are less needed in, in times of crisis. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, if, if anyone has any uh, response they'd like to make back to Barbara, the person who asked the questions, then do please add it to the Q&A. And as you ask questions, if you could uh, give your your name and and um, a, an affiliation, um, if if you could, Lisa Jacks from the University of Portsmouth. We're now going to go on to some other questions. Mm -hmm. um, one's from anonymous. Do do let me know who you are if you can. Um, and it's about genetically modified crops. You uh, talked about biofortification there, Barbara, which is not. Mm -hmm. The way it's implemented at this point in time is not through genetic modification. It's through standard uh, conventional breeding, uh, breeding programs. And we know that there's a very um, complex debate that goes on about genetically modified crops. Uh, what's your view? I think it's, it's not a silver bullet. So it's all very well saying, yes, genetically modified crops would solve a lot of problems. But I think the initial mistake was assuming it would solve a whole load of problems and it doesn't. It can be specifically applied in, in some instances to really improve 
crops with particular difficulties in, in geographical locations. So I think it's not about having one solution that solves all problems. It's using different technologies where they're most valuable and where they're most relevant. And for us in Europe, it might be a case that we have so many different technologies available to us that it might not necessarily add much value. It's so all the, the hoo-ha and the hype that went around it might not actually be worth the hassle because I think what we've we've seen from other technologies such as CRISPR can help us deliver something quite good. That's if we're not allowed, you know, if we're allowed to carry on using it and that doesn't go the same route down GMO. But I think it's about having the right technology in the right location for the right crop it's really as important as that but also understanding what the disadvantages of of using it might be versus the advantages and, and having a balanced approach to it rather than saying yes it's completely right or no it's completely wrong i think that there probably is a place for it but it has to be tailored to a specific outcome and not just saying yes we either use it or no we don't and that's my personal view Thanks, Barbara. Thank you. Moving on to a different topic now from Bella. Uh, she thanks you for a great presentation. Thank you. And uh, she asked, do you think there's a role for the new UK agriculture bill in the transition uh, that you're talking about? What what policies would and if so, what policies would that agriculture bill need to include in order to enable what you're suggesting to, to happen or to make it easier? I think there are probably three areas you could look at. So from a, a policy point of view, it would be looking at the environmental line. It could also look at the, the human nutrition. So marrying the human nutrition in with what we're doing and producing in terms of food. But then there's also looking at how, from a, another policy angle, how government departments could work together better. I think there was a, a report that came out recently, I think it was to do with City Food actually, looking at how there are 16 different government departments that all get involved in food. So if you don't have one central governing minister managing all of that, it just becomes a bit of a muddle. So I think going back to the original question, what could the, the UK, what could the UK farming strategy deliver? starting point environmental benefits so looking at what leafmark are doing and saying well leafmark tends to be the top tier of farmers growers in the uk and we should be using those same principles for all of farming it shouldn't just be the early adopters and the people who are really innovative who look at how they can build conservation and environmental techniques into their farming. We should use policy to drive that so it becomes part and parcel of what people are doing and it, it becomes part of a remuneration system or an incentivization system. So people are obliged to do it, but they're also remunerated. So it doesn't it doesn't put them out of pocket if if they do it, for example. The second thing on, on linking the human nutrition part with what we're growing at the moment We've got great systems in place that help us be almost fully sustainable in eggs and in beef and in lamb. But, you know, from a, a production of fruit and vegetables, which was supposed to be having five portions of a day, if everybody did start eating five portions of fruit and veg a day, we'd run out very quickly because the UK doesn't produce enough. We're only producing around half of what we need when you have to bring in the rest in. So I think we need a conversation within the the strategy for, for farming about food security and, and how much should we be producing nationally and how much should be relying on imports and that leads nicely to the the third point that i just briefly highlighted around the 16 different government departments how you get them to have an overarching view and, and somebody has to prioritize so for example if the treasury is saying we're going to give a fixed budget to prisons schools councils to spend on catering for the, for the people who use those services but actually we know from a nutritional health point of view you can't deliver nutritional food at that budget then another department has to step in for example health and social care and say no actually treasury we need more money because of x y and z so if you don't have one overarching person controlling where the priority has to sit then it makes it very hard for each government department to meet its KPIs, its key performance indicators and, and deliver what we really need for the population. 
So those are my three areas, I think. So uh, yeah, policy on making sure that we bring in environmental development, a policy on nutrition that links into production and, and one that just harmonises all the different decisions that the 16 departments have to make. Thanks, Barbara. Yes, I mean, the uh, Food Research Collaboration, having published our initiative at the Centre for Food Policy, um, publishing the, the document about the, the fact that food policy is made in, in 16 different departments, it certainly does seem to uh, make sense to call for um, a harmonising or coordinating uh, body, person, force. Um, do take a look at that uh, publication on the Food Research Collaboration uh, website that just came out. Um, OK, thank you. Uh, great, great response. The nutrition and production linkage is something that's particularly close to my heart. So thanks for mentioning that, too. So yeah. a couple of quite uh, practical questions. Um, uh, one question about um, some uh, businesses. So this is referring to businesses in Devon, actually, but um, it could be businesses <laughs> anywhere. Um, yeah. Like help in understanding how they can reformulate products. Um, but we formulation using natural food, food products rather than uh, what perhaps might be considered not natural food products. Uh, uh, and do you know if there's any free or low cost available to, an, to, uh, to help small scale independent businesses to conduct this kind of reformulation? Um, just if I could clarify the question back. So you're talking about startup businesses and, and new businesses who want to do new product development, but focusing on using that. Are you talking about more natural ingredients or is it more the, the processing? I wasn't quite clear. I think it means uh, natural ingredients. It's about reformulating or formulating, reformulating existing products or formulating new products using natural food ingredients. Uh, OK. OK, is there any free or, uh, or low mm -hmm. help available to businesses who want to do that to small businesses? With that one, I have an extensive network. So even though the, the answer's not top of mind right now, it could be something that I might come back to you on because I'm pretty sure I will know somebody within my network, but I just don't have anything top of mind right now to say to you, oh, try that organisation or try that one. I've probably got colleagues that would have been kicking me under the table right now saying I can help, but they're just not there. <laughs> so I'm afraid I'll have to come back to you on this one and see if I can help. That's OK. Please do get in touch with Barbara for, to get a follow up um, to that uh, to that question. Thank you. Next one is from Suzanne. She wants to you to give her some examples of criteria or standards um, mm. that are involved to achieve the certification to be a B Corps. And she asked whether this is costly um, for small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, in terms of costs off the top of my head, I know it's less than £2,000 for, I think it's if your turnover is less than £5 million, so I think it's, it's about between £1,000 and £2,000 and then it goes up in stages depending on your turnover, but do look at the B Corporation website for the exact information because uh, my memory is not what it was. The, there are around 250 questions on the self-assessment, so you can go on the website, log on, create an account, and then you can download the, the questionnaire, answer your question. I mean, when I say 250, it's not long questions. They're, they're built into around four sections, starting with governance and, and looking at finance and that type of thing, and then finishing with people, I think, if, if the order serves me, my memory serves me correctly. So you work your way through putting in the data from your business. So you need to know things like what your business turnover is, how you employ your people, what sort of contracts are on, what's the lowest pay, highest pay, that type of thing. And then you'll come out with a score at the end. So I think from memory, it's around 80 points to be able to be considered. So once you've done your self-assessment, you send that off, you pay your money, they'll assess you and then they'll verify all of the data that you've sent them to make sure you haven't well made it up, I guess. And then if you meet the criteria, you then are given the, the right to call yourself a certified B Corporation, so you get a certificate. But what I like about the system is they build a community around it. So if you look at Pickett or Innocent Drinks, they're always talking about the B Corporation family and the other organisations who are also B Corporation, and how they swap ideas and they have B Corporation Day and, and that type of thing. I think that was just a month or so ago. So. It really does feel like you're entering a whole community of businesses who just want to do good. 
So I'd highly recommend you, you have a look at the website and, and see because even a sole trader can can go ahead and do it. It's, it's not prohibitive at all in that way. Great, thank you. Um, good, good to hear. So a question now from Christian on on the food procurement. You highlighted uh, the cruel role of food procurement for uh, for building a, a future food system. Um, what role do you see for nutritionists and other uh, people who work in food policy in guiding future procurement policy? Like, how can they get involved? What do they need to do? What should they be doing um, to make this actually happen in practice? This, um, this question actually makes me laugh because it takes me back to an experience I had when I, I ran a workshop for people in procurement and new product development a couple of years ago. And, and I had no idea how to pitch it, really. <laughs> I went as a nutritionist saying, right, we're going to we're going to do this. We're going to do that. I gave them exercises on how they could think differently, talking about some real changes that are coming down the line. So I wanted to look globally and say we've got climate change, you've got older adults, you know, the percentage of the population who are aging. We've got all these different things coming down the line. So nothing that's, that's scarily new that we don't already know about. Existing problems that policymakers have got to think about. But it, they were almost blinded by it because I'd literally just piled in and said, oh, we're going to have this innovation workshop and you're going to look at how you can change your procurement and your recipe design to fit. And I think there's definitely space for a middle ground before you hit people with, with that type of thing because it's just so alien to the current way of thinking. So one of the exercises I gave them was if we've got some serious problems with climate change and you're importing food from Australia. So bear in mind this was a couple of years ago before the, the Australian fires, so it's probably a good job we did have this conversation. But you know, if you were importing a food item for Australia and you couldn't get it because of drought or X, Y, and Z, how would you then reformulate? How would you tackle that? How would you have a contingency plan? And and how would you look at the sustainability of your crops? And I think it really is about taking small steps. So rather than just throwing the big picture out there, it's about breaking it down, I'd say, into bite-sized pieces so you can take procurement people on that journey with you and not give them the rabbit caught in headlights approach, which I so badly did when I did my own workshop a couple of years ago. And obviously I've learned since then that it is about breaking things into small sections and looking at the big picture policy things like how we manage climate change and ageing population, so on and so forth, but showing people how it can affect them in their daily lives and the things that they're going to start to need to look at about changing supply and looking at how they build new relationships with suppliers and, and look at having sort of a, a different approach to what they currently do rather than being transactional having relationships where they understand and they're fully integrated into the supply chain. And there's one business I'm really surprised about how they do this, knowing what I know about the rest of their, their setup, and that's McDonald's UK. When you look at how McDonald's operate in the rest of the world, it's very different. But McDonald's UK, what they do is actually, you, they know the name of their farmers, for example. They know, you know, when there was the, the horse meat scandal, they knew exactly where their meat was coming from, whereas everybody else was running around going, I bought my meat from this person who bought it from that person who bought it from the other. So having a fully integrated supply chain where you know who your farmers are, you know their business model, you know how they're going to finance that business, and you know what their constraints are, and you have a research team who are looking constantly for solutions, I think that model is is the way to go. So you're, you're focusing on how you keep your supply chain going, and it's not just a transactional model where you say, how cheaply can I get this food so I can bring it into my business, for example. Thank you, great answer, uh, based on some interesting experience you had there. Uh, so ne next question, um, you gave some some really interesting examples of, of companies, um, including, well, uh, yeah, Mellow Yellow, Corn and, and Watercress. But the question here is is challenging that in a sense of saying these are great examples, mm -hmm. but they're quite, uh, in inverted commas, uh, middle class. Mm -hmm. um, they're not necessarily products that you might think are going to address the obesity crisis in in in, in areas of, of, of the UK. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
so what what else can be done um and is is it a question of having these kind of more to use a, an awful term middle class products um, and then using education or nudging or government intervention uh, in other ways or, or are there actually opportunities to try and get products that are going to be a bit more available to people with less income and, and uh, living in more challenging circumstances? I think we need to address a couple of issues here and I think one is that people with low incomes genuinely do not have enough money to spend on food. I wouldn't necessarily say that, that food is too expensive because when you look at the whole population we're only spending about well it's less than 10% of our income on food and if you think back to the, the quote I made from the Food Foundation they were saying that the, the bottom 10% income earners in the, the UK would have to spend 74% of their disposable income to eat healthily. So we know we've got a structural problem in terms of, of poverty there. The other part around, yes, these companies are all foods that we bought by middle class people. That's very true, but they're the companies that have got the, the finance and the structure and the ability to go out and be really innovative. And the, the mainstream companies aren't necessarily doing that because their margins aren't there in the same way. So it's very hard for them to, to strike out and look at how they can add value there because they would really have to, to take money out of their business and it, it's, it's very tight to do. But I think what tends to happen is if the people who have got the, the ability to strike out and do the innovation do that first, what you get is people then following their lead and seeing it how it's done so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can then look and see what systems have been put in place already. And that's why I like the, the leaf mark system of benchmarking because you can then see if you're new to the standard how you can put in similar things in place to get there. So you don't have to do the whole uphill climb of learning all the pitfalls and, and learning how to put something in place because somebody else has already done the hard yards. You can just copy it and implement it. And that's how things can fan out into the, the wider food sector. But I think it also takes a certain mindset. And if you're producing food at a certain price level, you probably are just thinking about price. You're not thinking about the wider environment or human health. And I think the education piece and the the dissemination of information piece is really important and that's why these sorts of brands can help. What I like about the Watercress company is yes it might be something that you can buy in, in Waitrose for example as a, a retail product but by bringing it in into an NHS setting it means then it's available for everybody. It's crop that wouldn't have been sold anyway, it's technically waste for want of a better description. So it, it's very low cost to produce and it is very low cost to put through the supply chain. So I think that's one example where there will be leverage and it can span out into the wider society quite easily because once it's gone into NHS, it makes it very easy to replicate at a retail level as well. Great, great answer. Thank you. Um, on to the next question, we've got some really interesting questions here, which is actually quite related to what you just said. Um, which is about the tent, this is from Ursula, which is a tension between the higher cost of environmentally sustainable food mm -hmm. versus intensively production uh, produced food at, at lower cost. And the question is, should we as consumers just accept that uh, in adverted commas, better foods are going to cost more um, and that we need to start seeing food prices in a, in a different way? And you just indicated in your answer there, Barbara, that um, you didn't think necessarily that that food was was too expensive. But yeah, what's your answer? Should we as consumers accept that um, better foods cost cost more? Mm, that's a difficult one. I'm almost in two minds on that. I think there is an acceptance that food prices are going to go up, but whether that's right or not is a, is a different thing. I, I do think that there are ways that we could now that we're leaving the EU manage that better so for example we could look at how we calculate the cost of production maybe putting some more money into supporting that or supporting people with the, the whole universal funding system where every household is, ma is made sure to have a certain amount of money so they don't have to worry. I know there are trials in the US on this where they just give people in a particular geographical location X amount of money per month to spend however they want and that solves a lot of problems. So I think the, the poverty and the, the food price issue, they need to be looked at together. 
Uh, but I think food prices will become more expensive and whether we accept that or not is very different from whether, you know, whether they are going to go up, they, they will go up, food prices will go up. But uh, we, we do need to appreciate, I think, that you can't have cheap food without somebody else in the supply chain paying for that cheap food. So when we are happy to pay very little amounts of money for our coffee and our tea and, and things like that, it's maybe because there have been people somewhere in the supply chain who have not been paid a lot of money for it. And when you look at the, the UK, the people who work in our food system generally are the ones who are paid the least amount of money to do that work of harvesting or packing and, and so on and so forth. So we do need to think closely about where our values are in society and how we remunerate people and, and how we make sure that everybody gets fed. Yeah, t t always a tough question, Barbara. That was a, a good answer, thank you. And, and now our next question from Rebecca about uh, COVID-19 responses. Do you have any examples um, of organisations in um, in different countries uh, who are working together in a more collective way to respond to the food systems challenges as a result of, of COVID-19. The point is, is that most of the um, responses have been quite uh, country specific and are there examples of, of a more collective approach that has been taken that you're aware of? To be perfectly honest, when the COVID-19 crisis started, I was very much focused on what was happening in the UK. I was taking an interest in other countries. For example, I've got friends and colleagues and family in other countries. So talking to an Australian food safety consultant, she was explaining how the lockdown was working very differently there. And it, it seemed that they've got a whole different approach in Australia, that they were keeping their food service sector open. So they were able to manage it by social distancing. I think that would have made a big difference in this country because so much of our food, nearly 30% is in that sector. When you close it off, it causes huge chaos, whereas the Australians were able to keep theirs open. It wasn't necessarily open in the same way, but it just meant that food availability could flow. So she said to me, I'm just going to nip out to my local drive through and I'm going to get myself a latte and I'm going to pick up a bag of, of muffins and uh, there was something else she was going to get. So she was able to actually use her local drive through to pick up some shopping items like bread and milk. Whereas we were, you know, got farmers pouring milk down the drain, but in Australia, they didn't have that situation. I know in the, um, oh, actually I'll give you an example in Ghana, which in Ghana and Nigeria, which I, I know of talking to friends and family there. And my cousin was saying to me, and I think this stems from the fact that because West Africa had the Ebola threat back in 2014, even though it's not every country had Ebola, they all put measures in place to make sure they didn't get Ebola. So infection control was managed a lot better. So from the get go, they closed the borders straight away. So unfortunately, I've got a cousin who was in the UK at the time looking after a sick parent, can't get home because Ghana just said, you know, we're closing the borders. But they also made sure that they kept the the local markets and the food stalls open but now what happens is when you go to a food stall or a market you wash your hands when you get there and you've got sanitizer when you get there so everybody is kept in the front of mind that you have to have good hand hygiene and if you've got symptoms you have to stay at home so they've managed to, to do that whole hygiene piece a lot better having said that talking to a Nigerian friend she was explaining that they did the full lockdown, closed all the markets and the majority of people, especially on, on lower incomes, get all of their food from markets. And now you're forcing them to have to go to a supermarket where everything's prepackaged, it's more expensive and it, it's a lot harder to get to. So the Nigerians haven't had the same system as, as they've done in, in Ghana and West Africa. It hasn't been the same in the region, which which surprised me because normally neighbouring countries find ways of doing things in, in similar ways. So that's two or three examples of countries where I've spoken to people about their everyday existence and how they feel that their government and their, their private sector have been able to work together. Great, excellent examples. Thank you very much. And uh, now from uh, Sham, he wants to follow up on the LEAF scheme, which you mentioned. Uh, the question is this, could you help me understand the incentive for companies to show their competitors how to improve their business? Wouldn't that put innovators at a disadvantage? 
Um, so just say that again. So it's about having competitiveness between. It's about the leaf scheme. And oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, so it's about the leaf scheme. Could you help me understand the incentive for companies to show their competitors how to improve their businesses? So I think it's saying ah, okay. if you adopt the leaf scheme, then how is that an incentive for competitors to improve their businesses uh, and wouldn't that put innovators at a, at a disadvantage? Does that make sense? It does make sense and that's an incredibly valid question because it, it completely describes the problem that I had initially talking to grow groups about sharing data. There's that reticence that you know at the moment they've just got a global overview so all you get is three bars on a report so you can see by the length of the bar if your bar is I don't know, 10 centimetres long, you can see that from an economic point of view, you're at your top of the game. If your bar is five centimetres long, you know that you're in the middle section. And if your bar is one centimetre long, you know that you're in the bottom section. So you can't really see any data behind it. But when you talk to, to growers about sharing that, that granular, granularity and being able to dig into the economics and look at profitability or being able to dig into the, the sector on on ethical and, and see how people are spending money on training and social uh, housing for their workers or whatever it is there is there is that reluctance but it, it's almost like people fall into two camps there's the camp of people who say oh i do want to share that information because i know that i can also benefit because i'm not perfect and people who say well i've spent a lot of money time and energy getting here i don't really want that to be given free to everybody else so I think it's about engaging with people and, and meeting them where they're at and taking them on that journey because I do feel that everybody will benefit and I, I have the same analogy for food safety I think that food safety everything should be open source and we should all be able to share data as soon as it's available on how we can improve food safety because everybody wins there nobody should be at a disadvantage in terms of sharing information I think if we want the people who haven't taken at all of these environmental initiatives and, and conservation initiatives to start doing that. It would be unfair to create a barrier of the people who are really good at it, don't share that information with the people who are, who are just starting on that road. But it's a very valid point and yeah, people do want to hang on to their com competitive advantage. But I think we need to start moving away from using the environmental the environmental strategy is a competitive advantage because the environment benefits us all, not just the individuals who happen to have paid money for that particular geographical space. Thanks, Barbara. A follow up question here about the procurement. Um, sorry, not follow up about procurement. An additional question, um, yeah. which is about um, the food waste issue that you raised and also the, 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 the issue about um the uh, kind of relationship between food waste and overconsumption as well uh, like in your experience have you have you managed to communicate these problems um and is there a communications challenge when you're talking about food waste uh, to different people in the food system well my experience has been about how i communicate with the the, the manufacturing and the producer sector so it's about really engaging with them. I haven't really had the experience of communicating with food waste outside of that system, if that makes sense. So, for example, talking to the producer organisation and saying to them, do you realise that, you know, food share or fair share have been given a grant to help primary agriculture get food off their farms and to charities so it can be distributed to people who are vulnerable and don't have fresh food in their diet. So that's been the focus, you know, working as a, an intermediary on that side to make sure that people aren't stuck with crops that they can't sell when there are people who don't have enough to eat. The, yeah, I think in terms of talking about that outside of that, that area, I haven't really engaged yet. I, there are plenty of people doing it, so I haven't really felt the need to to get into that space. Um, and first, I do a really good job, and there are lots of organisations who are in that space already. But I felt personally, from the work that I do, that we need to spend more time talking to the people who are actually providing that that source of food to make sure that they're aware of how to get it off farm and into the community. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, for that um, answer. And for these are a great lot of questions here. 
Um, I'm going to bring the, the questions to a, to a close now. Um, uh, thank you very much for all of those questions and those um, excellent answers. I think they were a really good set of questions, weren't they, Barbara? They were. Uh, just um, Rebecca Wells, apologies. I know you, I've just realised that you said you meant organisations in different countries. I wasn't dodging a question. I just didn't see it. Sorry. <laughs> well, that, that may have been me not, not reading it out properly. Sorry. <laughs> it was a good answer anyway. Uh, anyway, that, that was really um, insightful. I really particularly liked uh, speaking for myself. Um, the fact that what you've said um, this evening is very much driven by values, but it's also driven by a certain pragma pragmatism um, about how to get a system working better. Um, and that this is just something that we really should stop uh, arguing about whether it needs to happen. We just know it needs to happen. So let's just get on with working out the practice of how to do it. Um, and uh, and that's what you've shown us and given us some really good practical examples and shown your evident experience in, in, in having some answers to those uh, to those questions. And uh, so I'd like to thank you very much um, uh, for that. Uh, as I um, it was a real pleasure to have you. Sorry not to meet you in person yet, but uh, <laughs> the audience couldn't meet you in person. Uh, but thank you very much for the audience for joining us um, as well. Uh, you've been a great opener to our first webinar and we'll we'll publish our monthly webinar dates um, as they um, as they come in. And um, uh, this is part of our moving our food thinkers um, onto 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 webinars is, is just one of several actions that we're taking to um, in our response to the current pandemic. We're all uh, having having to respond and uh, a bit more detail about what we're doing is published on our website in the about page um, on the Centre for Food Policy website. Um, if you want to, if you want to see that, and of course, if you're interested in that educational programmes and Ambassador in Food Policy, please do um, apply and um, look on our website about that as well. We're taking a lot of applications at the moment. It's been fantastic to see uh, what interest has there's been um, despite some of the uncertainty in the educational sector. So that's great. Uh, so great to have so much engagement in food and food policy across the board. So with that, um, thank you very much um, indeed. Um, and um, I'm getting a lot of thanks coming through, um, uh, through to you, Barbara. So big thanks from the audience, a big thanks from me. Um, and I'm just going to uh, clap here because I can. <laughs> so, thank you and, um, and we'll be in touch. And if you've got any follow up uh, questions for Barbara, do let us know. And this thank course you. will be posted online. Thank you. Goodbye, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Good Bye. evening. Good rest of evening. Bye.